Okay, then let's uh, get in a pr prayerful mood as we listen to the um, prelude, which is called Dank. It's a Norwegian <clears throat> word for thanks or gratitude by Edvard Grieg. <laughs> Please rise for the call to worship. We come seeking to honor you. You reached out to us, even though we ignored you. You have called us into the community of caring. We offer you our praise and love. We are mindful that you first loved us. Would you turn to uh, page 291 for our hymn of praise and glory? Thine is the glory.
Please be seated. God of grace, for this time of worship we are thankful. We offer to you our thanksgiving for this season of resurrection. We offer our thanks to you because of your constant gifts. We have received adoption, forgiveness, and your spirit. And therefore, we praise you. Accept the worship of our hearts and minds this day. Amen. Turn to page 283 for our hymn of meditation. What wondrous love is this? join me in the confession. God of grace, thank you for your great love for us. You gave us your only son to bring us salvation. So we come before you with deep thanks. In spite of your love, we confess that we often disobey. We so often forget his sacrifice. Forgive us, Lord, and empower us to be your faithful followers. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Scripture says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now, God of grace, we accept afresh that gift with thankfulness. Amen.
Responsive reading this morning is Psalm 133. How good and how pleasant it is when kindred li live together in unity. It is like the dew of Hermon flowing down upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The epistle is from 1 John. We declare to you what was from him the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declared to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The story of Easter continues as the risen Jesus appears to his disciples. His words to Thomas offer a blessing to all who entrust themselves in faith to the risen Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he, he said, This he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples joined, rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand is in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. 
Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Please rise for the hallelujah. problem was so bad at the beginning of last summer, uh, Lois and I decided we quarantine and take a trip. <laughs> so we quarantined in our car for a month, and it was really safe, even with me driving. Uh, we spent two weeks on the beach near Lincoln City, o Oregon, and entertained members of the family, hers and mine. And then we went to the Olympic National Park, and took a ride on the ferry to Edmonds, Washington to see my daughter and her family. Then across Washington to Glacier where we took the road to the sun for 45 miles, but they'd marked it off so we didn't go into the reservation because of the COVID problem. Then south to Yellowstone and the Grand Tetons. And the geysers at Yellowstone were in full swing. And since the number of people traveling was down, we had no trouble seeing what we wanted to see. And uh, then to Dinosaur National Park, and finally two days at Mesa Verde National Monument. It was a trip and a half, and I still love to bore people with the details, even as I am this morning. <laughs> but what we find here in this passage in 1 John, and it says something that makes all of that just, just a memory. Because he described seeing Jesus. What a trip that would be. God's gift. In the gospel story that goes right along with this, our friend Thomas had come to the conclusion that John had in his gospel and in this letter that Jesus is God's gift to us, the very presence of eternal life. For them, for his fellow disciples, the reality of the resurrection was solved. And I'm sure that they, when he appeared and showed to them his hands and showed to them his side, they too placed their hands in, in, the, in the wounds and in the side. And in fact, that's probably where I, I've often thought, that's where Thomas got his idea, because they were telling him, this is what we did, and this is what we saw. And, and Thomas says, well, I'm not going to believe until I can do the same thing. But when he did, he got that opportunity. His response was, my Lord and my God. Dorothy Sayers says this about Thomas. It is unexpected but extraordinarily convincing that the one absolutely unequivocal statement in the whole gospel of the divinity of Jesus should come from doubting Thomas. It is the only place where the word God is used without qualification of any kind and in the most unambiguous form of words. And he does not say it ecstatically or with a cry of astonishment, but with flat conviction as of one acknowledging irrefutable evidence that to 
plus 2 equals 4, or that the sun is in the sky. Thomas says, you are my Lord and my God. And the amazing thing is that such an identity of Jesus remained in the teaching of the church, and it became the standard for the early church. Our material suggests that this notion that Jesus was Lord and God came to inform the faith of the early church. Paul would talk of Jesus understanding him as equal with God and not counting that equality with God a thing to be grasped. Or he would say God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Neither Paul nor Peter nor John, all loyal Jewish men, showed any hesitance in using the language of God for the Savior. It's also true that as you go through the New Testament, and oftentimes when you find an Old Testament reference involving Jesus, if you look back in the Old Testament to that reference, in the Old Testament, it's of God. But now it's understood to apply to Jesus, which again reflects this understanding that Thomas says here so convincingly, our Lord and our God. There were those, of course, because of their cultural upbringing, even as we know today, had a real difficulty with this claim in that day, they spoke of Jesus as only appearing as a human being. He only seemed to be present. And they had this problem with the, the spiritual versus the material, and, and to have the two mesh was just seemingly impossible philosophically for them to grasp. But John makes this emphatic emphasis, both at the outset of the Gospel and now trying to set right those who are having problems with this great idea of Jesus as Lord and God. And so John talks about he was heard. Those teachings were preserved. John himself, our writer, preserved teaching from Jesus. And it's quite unlike what we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But in all probability, because being familiar with those earlier Gospels and having his own specific memories of Jesus and Jesus' teachings, he wrote his Gospel to complement the others. But whatever, he was fully convinced that in Jesus he had seen his Lord and his God. John also says he was seen with our eyes. And as we read the Gospel narratives, they are truly narratives, and we have Jesus walking through Judea and Samaria and Galilee. Multitudes of people saw him, witnessed his works of compassion. Even the Jewish writer of the first century, a man by the name of Josephus, speaks of Jesus' wondrous works. For John and for the other gospel writers, he was seen, and they reported some of what they saw all convinced them that he was Lord and God. And then it says, which we looked upon. And the word there in the Greek is actually the word studied with the purpose of understanding. And so you have this notion from John that we looked at him, we observed him carefully, we saw his behavior around friends, enemies, publicans, sinners, women, children, all with the purpose of coming to a full decision regarding him as to whether he could be the Messiah or not. Though he riled the righteous for his willingness to meet and eat with all sorts of people, actually, for the disciples, I'm sure, they found that to be much more like God. We. He would say, we tried in every way to measure him, and we found him to be not wanting. The writer of the books of, book of Hebrews comments, probably recounting an ancient tradition, he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. His life was such studied, observed, but understood definitely as our Lord and our God. And then John says he was handled with our hands. 
Throughout the public ministry, he was handled by those who wanted healing. The disciples clasped his hands and embraced him, as did many others who cared for him, and found him to be a solid, real person. And after his resurrection, they handled him. They placed their hands into his wounds, grasped his hands in greeting, and knew him to be real, alive, substantial as any person. This was the word of life that was revealed in Jesus. The word of God made flesh. And he himself was eternal life, as well as the source for it, for all peoples, for he was God. And the result of Christ's work is that we have fellowship with one another and with God. And John says we have the joy of the eternal presence in our lives because he is the eternal Lord and our God who has come to us. But as we go through that passage further, we know that John doesn't stop there because he, he not only wants to help his readers understand who Jesus is, but to understand what the ramifications for life are for those who do understand and accept. It is important to have the proper understanding of who Jesus is, to kind of come to that, to grow into it, whatever. But it's also important to reflect that in the quality of life we live. John says fellowship with God demands it. There have always been those who thought they could accept the Christ without walking the life. And John begins his section with the contrast that if God is light, and he is, then our lives must increasingly reflect that light. And perhaps one of the most pernicious lies that we have perpetrated is that one can accept Christ and become a Christian without any sort of change of values or behavior. The billboard religion of believing needs to have the complement of behaving. John puts it very plainly that since God is light, we must avoid walking in darkness. And in fact, he says, if we say we have fellowship with God and while we follow a life that is just dark, we are liars and we are not doing the truth. Rather, to enjoy the fellowship of the Christ is to do the truth is to walk in the light. One can only imagine that some in the church were trying to say that they had been baptized, therefore they were without sin. On the other hand, there were those evidently who were denying the reality of sin at all. With John, he says, <laughs> we just have to face the fact. We have all sinned. This is like what Paul says. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's as ugly as it is, it's true, unfortunately. And the whole work of Christ's salvation, his death and life for us, was because of the reality of sin in our lives. To say otherwise, John says, is to call God a liar. The truth is that we have sinned and we have sinned, and the remedy isn't denial of that truth, nor just a total capitulation to that truth. But the remedy is to confess our sin and to ever demonstrate our understanding that we depend on God's grace. To confess our sins, John says, is the true pathway of the life of the Christian. To confess our sins is to find the forgiveness of God. It's one of the greatest challenges of our lives, I think. And yet that very reality of sin that exists in our lives calls us to our constant reminder of the need for the grace of God, even as it reminds us of the joy of sin forgiven. That reality ensures that we do not become spiritually arrogant, nor does it allow us to become spiritually depressed. We walk with the intent, day by day, to bring honor to God, and we do. By his miracles, we do. But it's not because we have some sinless quality in our lives, but because God is present in our lives. We press for spiritual maturity, and part of that is a realization that we have sin in our lives. But that is always under the cleansing power of Christ, 
And we need not fear our saved status before God. The writer F. W. Faber wrote a short bit that I found very helpful. What an amazing, what a blessed disproportion between the evil that we do and the evil we are capable of doing and seem sometimes on the very verge of doing. If my soul has grown tares when it was full of the seeds of nightshade, how happy ought I to be? And that the tares have not totally strangled the wheat, what a wonder it is. We ought to thank God daily for the sins we have not committed. Our fellowship is with the Lord who made himself known in the flesh and blood Jesus, through whose death we have found life. And that life continues as we continue to be real about our condition before God, that we are saved through his grace. We do not and cannot save ourselves. Thank God that God has found us. And God has rescued us. I'm going to share this wonderful story about Albert Einstein. You may have heard it. Einstein was traveling from Princeton on a train, and when the conductor came down the aisle to punch the passenger's tickets, he couldn't find his. He looked in his vest pocket, he looked in his pants pocket, he looked in his briefcase, but there was no ticket. <coughs> Sounds like me going on a trip. The conductor was gracious. Not to worry, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are, and I'm sure you bought a ticket. As the conductor moved down the aisle, he looked back and noticed Einstein on his hands and knees, searching under the seat for his ticket. The, the conductor returned to Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry, I know who you are. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Einstein rose and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. The good news from the Apostle John is we know who we are and we know where we're going. We have been told by the Savior that his life and death has promised us eternal life. And Sundays that are troubled don't change that, and unemployment doesn't change that, and neither does divorce or bankruptcy or cancer or depression or failure. Through elation and deflation and every emotion in between, this truth remains we know whose we are, and we know where we are going because of the Son of God. So we be honest with our Lord, confess our sins, and continue to strive to walk in the light and rejoice in his wonderful gift of life. Amen. A song number 425 in the Red Hymnal.
my passion stuff and pride. I now surrender glory abide. Oh, Holy Ghost, revival comes from me. Uh, well, thank you. I'd report to that Janice Thompson, she and her husband Ardis, have been here from time to time. She helps direct a church program out, uh, kind of a cowboy church program, out uh, towards uh, Mount Lemon on a regular basis. But anyway, she has uh, been diagnosed with cancer at stage two, but she's gone through one treatment and the last text I had from her is that she's feeling quite good. So, again, pray for Janice and uh, for her recovery. Others? Yeah, in fact, she was not only home, but she was sitting right there at 9 o'clock service. Oh, great. Yep, yep. So it was great to see her again. She's doing well, but she needs prayer. Others? Yes, Binky.
Dana Clements. Others? Yes, Britta. Ah. Oh. Thank you. Well, let's pray together, please. Our God of grace and mercy, we are so thankful for the opportunity we have to bring our loved ones before you for your blessing. We give you thanks for the many ways in which you've acted in the lives of those for whom we have prayed in days past and have seen wonderful things, wonderful healings, wonderful strength, new hope, new life in the lives of so many. And we give you praise. And so we ask for your measured work of love and grace upon these mentioned today. For Donna, and Sabine, for Jane, for Janice Thompson, and for Nancy Swinburne, and husband John. For your continued strength for Stacy, and for Risa, and we give you thanks for all these, and for your blessing upon their lives. Thank you for your work in the life of your church worldwide, and may it continue to stand, encourage, bring courage, support, and meet the needs of your children. Bless this country and bring its stability, end its division, bring healing to minds that can be so dark. May I find your light and find the transformation and joy of your presence. And now we pray that prayer Jesus taught us and we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Turn to 567 in the Red Hymnal as the song in preparation for communion.
At a meeting in November, the deacons decided unanimously to offer a communion each Sunday. And uh, for those who want to share and partake in this and feel they, that is where they are, it will be great. And for those others who disagree, that is fine too. It was just an off idea to offer to the congregation the opportunity to partake. And uh, we all know what this is about. John talks about handling and seeing and studying. And, and I think this is the nearest we have to it, other than perhaps fervent prayer, where we handle this bread and we remember his giving of his life, his body for us. And we remember this fruit of the vine as a reminiscence of his blood shed for us, his death. So we handle things that are seen, for they communicate to us so much of what is unseen in the presence of our Lord. So let us think about these things. We remember that night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body given for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And then at the end of the meal, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the remission of sins. Drink you all of it. So let us pray. God of grace, thank you for this appointment that we can fulfill with you. Thank you for these visible reminders of the life of our Savior and the gifts of our Savior. 
And we pray that as each one partakes, they find renewed strength in the bread and renewed cleansing in the fruit of the vine. May your grace make palpable to our spiritual lives your presence and your love. Thank you. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Share in the bread of life.
experience of this scope of life. If you would, turn to number 389 in the red hymnal for a closing first verse. If you can stand, that would be great. say thanks to Britta for arranging for our generous amount of food over in the hall and that it was gifted to us by Stacy and uh, so we're thankful indeed. Our gracious God, thank you as we look forward to this new week that you are with us Thank you that your grace overshadows us. Thankful that your spirit encourages and guides us. The love of Jesus ever inspires us. So may we walk in your light and for your glory. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you.